I think it's a, it's a heavy enough here and giving a presentation in, in person. So first, I maybe have to disappoint you. Uh, we, we do not characterize our velocity distribution in the experiment. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the chopper wheel is uh, in the neighboring lab, but they uh, yeah, do a chop excitation of the, two, of the two X state and characterize the velocity distribution. That's why I will not elaborate on this uh, X state. Um, yeah, so I will uh, talk about uh, the same transition, but uh, with a different laser technique. So we are using a frequency pump to, to drive our excitation. Um, this has several advantages and, of course, uh, also disadvantages. So we have a uh, more efficient second harmonic generation. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we, have, as, uh, we can have chirp in our pulses, for example, that can produce uh, additional effects that uh, disturb our line. And uh, yeah, we have all the, all the weird things that come around to produce pulse lasers. Um, yeah, so yeah, but firstly, I'd maybe also like to repeat your short introduction. and. Uh, talk a bit about motivation, why we are studying hydrogen. Um, so the, the picture that's shown, that has been shown already, and uh, yeah, we'll probably all, all of you uh, have heard it already several times. Um, if you want to calculate the energy levels of uh, hydrogen atoms, you can kind of rephrase, uh, you can find a formula that looks a bit like this. So uh, you have this first very well-known term from elementary lectures uh, from the Schrodinger equation. And you have all kinds of corrections to these that arise uh, due to you know, Dirac equation and uh, quantum electrodynamics. And uh, all these, they depend on these corrections, depend on many different uh, physical constants. And then finally, among those corrections, there's also this finite nuclear size effect, so where you get the shift of the energy level, um, which is proportional to the charge radius of the nucleus squared. And uh, yeah, all of the other constants that are summarized here can be probed or measured uh, more precisely by, by other experiments, but actually hydrogen spectroscopy is uh, most sensitive to the Richter constant and to nuclear charge radius, in our case, the, the total charge radius. And therefore, we always want to measure two transitions. Um, because you have, you have two unknowns in your formula and uh, yeah, if one of these transitions you uh, usually you employ the one with fewest transition because it has by far the narrowest natural language. And then you combine this with any other transition that you measure and extract a Richter constant and a charge radius. And by these means, you can compare these different uh, measurements that you have checked firstly for consistency. And secondly, you can also claim that you, or you also determining these two constants. Yeah, and over the, over the years, people did that and measured several different, different transitions in hydrogen and then they extracted total charge radii, and uh, these put the average together to a roughly consistent value in, until 2010, uh, even until 2014. However, then uh, in 2010 and further, con con further proof in 2013, muonic uh, hydrogen was measured, which is much more sensitive to this finite nuclear size effect due to the higher mass of the muon. And yeah, as you can see, there was quite a large discrepancy between the previous average and these muonic values. And uh, this became known as the proton radius puzzle that we've uh, all heard of. And therefore, in the next years, uh, the hydrogen spectroscopists set out again and measured more transitions. And now some of them even seem to support this smaller muonic value. And uh, yeah, because of this, in the next uh, the big evaluation of uh, natural constants, it was decided to, to include this uh, muonic measurement. And uh, therefore, the proton radius shifted and uh, got much smaller error bars. And as you can see, uh, there still also were recent hydrogen measurements, like the one from, from Paris that Camille just presented, um, that support this larger uh, radius. And uh, uh, our measurement is now here, so it was published uh, after the 2018 evaluation of natural constants. And uh, as you can see, it kind of supports the smaller muonic value. Um, but yeah, the and the interesting thing is that we still have a discrepancy to the, to the Paris setup. Um, and here you can clearly see that yeah, this, this discrepancy cannot arise due to uh, errors in the calculation or uh, new physics that are somehow not yet discovered because it's actually the same transition and uh, we really, really need to look at our experiments more closely and, and check why, why we have this disagreement. So yeah, this is uh, why I'm going to talk about uh, our spectroscopy setup. 
So uh, yeah, we do two photon spectroscopy. So we need two photons of 205 nanometers with size of three S states. This will then decay via the two P states. We collect these uh, red photons as well as our four feet signal. So it just wants to put the entire. Um, yeah, so I will first explain this technique of uh, direct um, two photon direct signal response spectroscopy. Quickly present our setup, and then also uh, present the recent results that we have and uh, the biggest discrepancy that we are currently analyzing and dealing with. So it's uh, let's start out with the with the experimental technique that we're using. So uh, here you see a sketch uh, of the spectrum of the frequency pump. So you have this very broad envelope with the very narrow modes underneath. In our case, we are using a, a pump that has a width of roughly 150 gigahertz. We want to make one of these modes resonant with exactly half of the transition frequency. Um, this means we need a frequency pump at 205 nanometers. Um, yeah, this is uh, a picture of the same laser in the time domain. So it's a pulsed laser with a big phase relation between these pulses. As I already said, this pulsed nature of the laser uh, enhances our High, uh, or second harmonic uh, generation efficiency. So this is quite a large uh, advantage for us to generate these 205 nanometer lights. Um, uh, and thanks to, uh, or by using like also two counterpropagating laser beams, um, we can get the excitation inherently Doppler free. And we achieve this also by, by coupling the laser light to photography. Um, yeah, thanks to the, to the pulses, the excitation will really only take place in the very center of this cavity, so only a very small region where these two pulses overlap. Um, and therefore, our and we call this the, the pulse collision volume. And therefore, it's very easy to shield this small volume from uh, electric fields um, that would uh, cause most um, electric uh, field departures. Uh, that was our line. So the next ingredient for our experiment are the hydrogen atoms. We generate them in a radio frequency discharge and then guide them into this uh, copper nozzle, which is in our case cooled to 7 Kelvin. Um, so we, we have a liquid helium flow cryostat. And uh, from these, the atoms can escape through this through hole and propagate along the laser beam into this pulse collision volume, where they will be excited and emit this fluorescent signal. And uh, another nice advantage of our experiment is that the hydrogen atoms can also escape to the other side in the laser beam, and uh, there emit there they will also be excited and emit a fluorescent signal. But as they will here only see one pulse at a time, um, they, this, the emission signal here will be heavily Doppler broad because yeah the the pulse there's only one pulse coming from one side and both photons will be taken from this pulse, and uh, this broadening here is much wider than the spacing of our frequency pump, and therefore the this uh, excitation will not vary when we scan over the resonance line of the atoms because uh, there will always lie several uh, pump modes within the uh, within the envelope of this Doppler broadened line, and therefore we get the perfect normalization signal that does not change at all when we scan the frequency of our laser, but it has all the other other variations due to uh, power variation in our laser beam or the amount of atoms that uh, escape from this nozzle here. Um, yeah, so we have and with this normalization, we can really uh, improve the quality of our um, fluorescent signal. Then uh, you can actually reach the same excitation rate as with a continuous wave laser with a frequency pump, because not only one mode will contribute to the excitation, but uh, always two photons from the two neighboring modes can team up and also drive the excitation, or also the two photons from the next outer line mode. So we can really utilize the whole power at, that we generate at 205 nanometers. And also the AC spark shift uh, coefficients are uh, the same as with a continuous wave laser. Uh, so let's have a look at our experimental setup. We start out with a also with a titanium sapphire laser, but with 820 nanometers. So we get uh, two watts um, uh, of mode lock power. Um, here you see a sketch of the, the spectrum here. So we have this broad envelope and uh, this evenly spaced pump piece. We uh, do two second harmonic generations of this light, which should generate around 50 milliwatts of 205 nanometer power. So we see this is the this difference between 10 milliwatts and 50 milliwatts. This is the, the efficient and efficiency enhancement that you get by using pulse lasers. So uh, here you see two pictures of our two crystals. We are using an LBO and a BBO crystal for the second harmonic generation, and these are both placed in enhancement cavities. 
um, to increase the conversion efficiency. Yeah, and then this light is coupled into this uh, enhancement cavity, which I've already shown you. Um, we measure the absolute frequency of this uh, 820 nanometer laser by overlapping it with a continuous wave laser, fluorescence laser, which is locked to an ultra low expansion cavity and continuously me um, measured by using a commercial frequency pump. And uh, yeah, this here you see the, um, if you overlap these two lasers, you will get the deep uh, node with the frequency of one of the comp, uh, the different fre frequency of one of the comp modes, hence this reference laser. And you can lock this, uh, this deep frequency with a phase lock loop. Um, and thereby, um, by setting this deep frequency to different val values, you can shift um, one of the comp modes over the resonance line of the atom. So uh, yeah, this is uh, how we scan our frequencies. Here you see an uh, artistic sketch of the enhancement cavity. So we have these two mirrors. Here, this is the copper nozzle where the hydrogen atoms escape um, to both sides. So on the right-hand side, there's several fibers that collect the Doppler broad normalization signal. And on the other side, the atoms propagate into this Faraday cage here where we have the pulse collision volume and several different fibers looking with lenses at the different positions of this pulse collision volume. So um, we need to uh, record the fluorescence at, di at different positions within the pulse collision volume because there is an uh, effect uh, that arises due to an interplay of the chirp of the laser pulses that introduce an effect harmonic generation and the diffusive beam nature of our atomic source and that shifts the, that actually creates a, a line shift that depends on the position in the pulse collision volume. And therefore um, we measure the federal frequency at different positions and then extrapolate this effect. Um, for the central detector. So uh, this is a picture of the, the detector. You see these uh, meshes here that form a Faraday cage. And the laser beam will propagate here from top to bottom and back. And here you see these uh, slots where we insert these uh, lenses here, um, which uh, couple the fluorescent light with the optical fibers, guide them out of the vacuum chamber, and uh, um, guide it into photometer biases. Yeah, and uh, with this great setup in 2020, we published uh, this measurement here. And this measurement was published. Um, I already said it supports the, the smaller hydrogen, uh, the smaller proton radius. Um, uh, and but the most interesting is probably this, this disagreement here around the two standard deviations that we, we need to investigate and look at. <coughs> so yeah. Um, as uh, similar as the Paris experiment, we have the lots of um, different systematics and uncertainties that we have to characterize and analyze um, while, while we do the data analysis. And all of these create uncertainty. And the sum of all these uh, gives us the, the total measurement uncertainty. Um, yeah, the, the most important systematic line shifting effect we try to characterize by scanning experimental parameters and looking at the, the dependency of the line center when we scan these parameters. So uh, we also are suffering from the second order Doppler effect, for example, which depends on the temperature. Um, so we assume that it's, or we know that it should be linear in temperature. Therefore, we get this linear um, coefficient. We, must, we just record data at different temperatures and uh, yeah, assume a, depend a linear dependency with this uh, parameter. Then we have these C folds, which I already mentioned. These are, this is the effect that arises due to the chirp of the laser pulses and depend, and creates a different line center at different positions of the pulse collision volume. And it should, uh, and the, the frequency shift in the center of the pulse collision volume should depend uh, on the difference um, of the line centers at the two outer line points of the pulse collision volume. Hmm. Oh yeah, the CIFOTs stand for uh, chirped induced residual first order Doppler shift, but it's, uh, <laughs> As I'm, as I'm not going to explain this effect, <laughs> I thought I, I could quickly rush over it and just <laughs> make you ignore it. Um, then, yeah, we see a, a shift due to the background pressure in our vacuum chamber. Um, it should be linear in the amplitude of our uh, fluorescent signal. And then we also have an AC stark shift uh, that's proportional to the laser power, actually, it arises due to the density of the excitation laser and it uh, should be directly proportional to the uh, laser power that's coupled out of the cavity. Um, and then 
we apply this kind of this global model here. So we call it the global fit. We assume that the central frequency that we're measuring depends on all linearly on all of these parameters. Then we record around 10,000 lines and uh, globally fit this parameter by minimizing this chi-square here. And then we get um, yeah, all of these different coefficients, um, the linear coefficients. And we also, we don't rely solely on this global fit, but we also uh, build theoretical models and run simulations to uh, get estimates on, on these parameters here. And as you can see, they agree quite well for this um, C4, so for this chirp induced uh, first order Doppler shift, and also for the second order Doppler shift, but somehow for the AC star shift and the hydrogen measurement, there is a factor of four discrepancy. Um, yeah, and uh, this was kind of the, the largest uncertainty in the, in the hydrogen measurement. And uh, yeah, one, but of course, in, this, in the global fit, so when we correct the, the central frequencies, we of course use the, the experimentally found values. So whatever the, the effect is that causes this, this discrepancy, we think that we have kind of, uh, that we have it under control or it's, it is taken care of by this global fit, but it would be intellectually nice to also understand why this effect, uh, why the AC star shift is shown so much bigger in our measurement. And yeah, this is what we're currently looking into. Um, so the first idea why this, um, this shift is so much, uh, this AC star shift is so much larger was um, that maybe the intensity and the focus during the measurement was higher. So you, can, you model this AC star shift by measuring the power that's transmitted by the cavity. Then you know the geometrical parameters of your cavity. From this, you can extrapolate the intensity distribution. And if you also know the transmission of your outcoupler mirror, you can get an uh, AC star shift coefficient. However, um, when this, this cavity for the hydrogen measurement was built quite close to criticality to get uh, as small focus as possible and uh, to, to get maximum fluorescence signal. But uh, for this reason, it also depends very critically on the radius of curvature of the mirrors. And uh, yeah, as so even a small deviation in this radius of curvature could create a large a deviation in the focus size. And because of this, um, we thought maybe there, there was a manufacturing error. So even within the manufacturing bounds of the mirrors, it would have been possible to get a factor of two different ways. And this could explain this factor of four discrepancy. However, the mirror radio were measured afterwards and uh, it was confirmed that uh, they actually fit. But still for the next measurement, which was performed with deuterium, uh, mirrors of larger radius of curvature were used. Um, so this should firstly reduce the AC star shift in total and get a larger focus. And uh, secondly, hopefully also reduce the discrepancy. Unfortunately, uh, in the deuterium data, we see an um, AC star shift coefficient that's even larger. Um, but yeah, take these with a grain of salt. So we are still uh, working on the data analysis and uh, kind of preliminary results. But uh, yeah, so we really need to investigate this further. So probably the, the mirror radii were not the problem. Um, so the ideas that we have is that uh, the, maybe the mirrors are degrading. So as Pauline already said, if you shine UV light on mirrors in vacuum, you see this effect that they are, uh, the UV light is cracking up residual gas. That's uh, any, any organic molecules in your vacuum chamber. This makes your mirrors degrade. Um, and we were thinking maybe this is slightly happening. So we are actually preventing this degradation by flushing the mirrors with oxygen. Um, and then we don't see any degradation of the mirrors anymore. But maybe they're de just degrading a little bit, and this degradation then would depend on the intensity that's in the inside the cavity, and then you maybe get a, a frequency a shift of the reflected light. Um, yeah. So this was one of the ideas, or maybe you get an intensity or a, a spatial modulation of the reflected beam. So these are things that we need to look into. So we had recently um, a big change in our laser system. We're now uh, currently building it up again and uh, trying to get more UV power than before. So we hope that we get soon around uh, even 100 milliwatts. And um, with this higher laser power, it should be possible to, to analyze the possible mirror degradation uh, easier. Then it could also be that we somehow create patch charges due to UV light uh, that's somehow straight inside this cavity. And of course, the, the amplitude of these charges would also depend on the intensity of the laser. So it would look like an AC star shift in our, our extrapolation. 
and uh, basically it could be any other parameter in the experiment that coincidentally drifts with the laser power. So unfortunately in this hydrogen and deuterium measurement, the laser power was not varied intentionally, but it was only varied by letting the BBO crystal degrade. So um, our 205 nanometer power is kind of dropping over the time scale of 10 to 15 minutes um, because this, there is um, degradation of the BBO crystal happening. And this was the only effect that, that varied the laser power. So it could be any parameter, like maybe the, the transversal beam profile um, that drifts with this together with this laser power, and uh, we would see it as an ACES dark shift. So whatever it is, uh, we're going to analyze this more closely. Um, so the next step will definitely be once we have the laser system running again, um, to intentionally vary the laser power and really measure this ACES dark shift coefficient. And then uh, yeah, also check for a possible mirror degradation yeah, look at all the different parameters that we have uh, recorded during our experiment. Now, so to quickly sum up, uh, I've presented you our spectroscopy technique, um, our experimental setup. And then I've quickly talked about the hydrogen measurement from 2020 um, and the AC stack shift discrepancy that arose during it. And now uh, yeah, we're currently analyzing this deuterium data that was recorded directly after the hydrogen measurement. And we hope to, to publish it once we have understood this as a stack shift uh, discrepancy. Now, yeah, I'm, uh, this is the team that, that's contributing to this experiment. And I would like to thank all of them for all their work. And uh, now I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Diego. I guess I'm not supposed to ask any questions. <laughs> Somebody else, uh, Claudio. Do you want up the microphone? Um, it, it's it's really cool to have these two nice presentations, one after the other. Um, something reminded me of a talk by I think Joseph Tan from NIST a long time ago about lithium spectroscopy where th there was a discrepancy and they found out it had to do with the anisotropy of the fluorescence. Can you guys have anything like that happening in this, in this system? You say Which that. means if you don't get the four pi uh, star radian fluorescence, it's not the same as if you look at just, you know, a given direction. Yeah. Yeah, so we are only recording light from, from two directions. So especially in the center of the pulse collision volume. But, uh, uh, so I'm not aware of any anisotropy. It's a quantum interference. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. it so it's related at the same. It was the, it, this effect was related to the interference by this region. Uh, it's small. The answer is it's yeah. there. We investigated and it's small. Yeah. The, the answer is almost always this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. So I have a question. You could also, in principle, collect the fluorescence from the 2p to 1s and that's uh, my first question and the second one is in this system where you have in principle four photons involved could you have a coherent four-way mixing that one needs to consider um i guess this would also relate to the uh, to this quantum interference of the different line and the interference of the emitted light um and so this was uh, quite vastly uh, characterized by my, by my predecessors and uh, these, these effects are, are small. And they have also tried to to, uh, to, to, to measure this fluorescence light of the 100, uh, of the 121 nanometer photon. Um, but uh, I think these trials were not so successful because it's much more difficult to build detectors for this light and you cannot couple it into fibers and just get it out of the vacuum chamber. One more question. <laughs> But you have kind of an AC Zeeman effect, which could explain the discrepancy to the AC Schlag effect. Um, which is happening uh, to, to M1 transitions. So I so this this AC stack shift. So we are using just the AC stack shift coefficients uh, that are calculated from from theorists. So I guess uh, like this does not include any AC Zeeman coupling. I I don't know mm -hmm. if this there could be something like this. Which is not included in the modeling. Thomas? I mean, the P field of the laser. 
guess it's way off resonance and it's small. And it's for one of us. Um, Thomas, you answer? Yeah. Uh, well, you have to compare the um, E and the B. And what is the scaling between C2? Could you be like negligible? Yeah. So maybe yeah, there is, but it's not at the accuracy we are. Like you aim for one kilo. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. below one kilo. So yeah. it will not be any. So as you said, it's always we investigate until you know it's too small. Thanks, Paul. We should get better organized with the microphones in the next second, maybe. Thanks for the talk. Maybe it's not um, these are fair question. Maybe the first. At what point uh, do we have to start worrying about other moments of the fourth HR distribution? So the exact shape, the fourth moment, for example. Related to both talks. Maybe that's a question for Chris. Yes, yeah, so, the, so the, the next is the third moment, our cube. And this is of the order of um, 30 hertz for the 1S2S uh, for the 1S2S transition. And this is accounted for. Because it, we know we know the charge distribution, one has to know that we also include uh, in elastic contributions, which is progressivity, which is almost of the same order. So the thirty plus thirty is about sixty hertz, which, which has to be added uh, to the one s two s. One s three s will be almost the same. Uh, ben, maybe as a follow up, that that concerns theory, right? But it cannot explain the discrepancy between the Gaussian and the Paris experiment because it's just pure experiment should agree, no matter what theory says. That's, that's why I think it's so important to find out why it doesn't. <laughs> so the main difference is the velocity of hydrogen atoms. Yes, there's others like the, like the chirp and I, I'm the I, I'm yeah. Yeah. more complicated.